Welcome back to another edition of First Chapter Friday for the Lehman Library. We are going to continue with our zombie theme. So if you're watching these videos in order, it is the second Friday in October. Our previous First Chapter Friday was a young adult, more serious zombie story. So I thought I would lighten it up just a little bit this time around. So we are going to share the first chapter of Zombie Baseball Beatdown by Paolo Bacigalupi. So for this particular book, we have a group of friends who love to play baseball. Some of them are better at baseball than others. And as you can tell pretty much from the title and the cover of the book, as they are practicing playing baseball, the zombie apocalypse happens. So I'm going to share with you portions of chapter one from Zombie Baseball Beatdown. Losing stinks. Don't let anyone tell you it builds character or any of that junk. It stinks. It stinks that someone else is beating you. It stinks that you've worked hard and it's going to mean nothing. It stinks that you can't hit the ball the way you want and can't feel the grounder the way you imagined. A thousand things about losing stinks. But it stinks worse when you're stuck in the dugout on a 102 degree day in the humidity and the heat index is 120 and sweat is pouring off of you and your team is losing. Not because you stink at baseball, but because your baseball coach, Mr. Cochran, stinks at coaching. But Mr. Cochran won't listen to you when you tell him he's got the batting order wrong. He likes big hits and loves guys who hack at the ball and swing for the fences and all that junk. And he doesn't understand about getting runners on base. He doesn't know squat about baseball. But you know the thing about losing that stinks even worse than that? Knowing you're the one who's going to get blamed. When you're finally up at bat with Miguel on third and Sammy on first and you're down by two in the bottom of the six and you're the last and final hope of the Delby Diamondbacks, you're the one everyone is going to remember. Maybe I could hit a single on my good days and if the pitcher was off his game, but basically for me, the ball just moves too darn fast. My dad says I swing with my heart. Well, he said that after I struck out once and spun myself all the way around and all the other kids were so busy laughing at me, even my own team, that nobody minded so much that we lost another game. After that game, my dad came up to me and put his hand on my shoulder and said, don't worry about it, Robbie. You swung with your heart. You were all in. We can work on your swing. As soon as I'm back from the rigs, we'll work on it. Of course, baseball season was going to be over by then, so my swing wasn't going to improve in time to save me from more humiliation. Dad works oil and gas rigs, 10 weeks on, two weeks off, so I was on my own. There was no way I should have been batting cleanup, I can tell you that. But there I was, sitting on the bench, watching the lineup come down to me, like a slow-moving train wreck. Mrs. Riley here. I'm going to pause Chapter 1 for a second and give you a little quick summary to shorten this up a little bit. Robbie strikes out. It's up to him. There's runners on base. All he has to do is get one hit, just a single, and he can't manage to do it. So here we are picking up on the second half of chapter one. And that was it. End of the game. Everyone laughing at me. Miguel walking toward me, shaking his head. My mom up there in the stands, sitting there like a bright yellow dandelion, looking sad, like I disappointed her, even though she never really liked baseball anyway and only really cared about cricket and Sammy Rigoni coming over to me as I started to get up. To my surprise, Sammy reached down to give me a hand up. I let him pull me upright, but then he jerked me close. Coach is right, you're a crummy hitter, he said in my ear, and then he gave me a shove that made me stumble back. Miguel and Joe saw it happen and charged in to back me up, but then Sammy's friends were there too, Rob Ziegler and Bill Tuffin and the rest of them glaring, all of them bigger and stronger than us, except maybe Miguel. There was no way we could beat them. If you stacked up the stats, a fight with Sammy's friends added up to game over. Come on, Robbie, take a swing, Sammy goaded. I want to watch you spin around again. He gave me another push. Let's see that pretty twirl you do. Parents were starting to stand up in the bleachers, trying to see what was going on between us, but they were too far away to help. Sammy gave me another shove. Why don't you swing, twirly? Let's see your swing. Miguel grabbed my bat off the ground. I'll take a swing. That got everyone's attention. Sammy took a step back, and I swear he looked scared. Joe gave a whoop of glee. Oh, yeah, now it's a fight. I grabbed the bat away from Miguel. Are you crazy? Someone's got to shut him up, Miguel said. Mr. Cochran came busting in between us as I turned around to glare at Sammy. What's going on here, he shouted. Sammy pointed at us. They were going to hit me with that bat. That's not what happened, I started to say, but Mr. Cochran shut me down. Cool it, Jones. I don't take time off from Monroe just so I can watch you pick fights on this team, especially not after you lose a game. I didn't pick. Is that a baseball bat in your hand? 
uh, Sammy was grinning at me from behind coach's back. What are you thinking, Jones? You don't pick fights with your own team, and you sure don't threaten another human being with a bat. Sammy's human, Joe asked. You sure about that? Mr. Cochran swung around. Save the smart remarks, mister. One more and you're off this team. I tried again. I didn't pick the fight, but Mr. Cochran was all wound up now. Not another word, Jones. You're an inch from being kicked off this team yourself. You snark from the bench and you pick fights after you lose games. That's not good sportsmanship, not by a long shot. I could tell Mr. Cochran was going to go on, but someone honked a horn from the parking lot. He glared at us all, looking from Sammy and Travis and Rob and Bill to me, to Miguel and Joe. Parents were coming down onto the field now to see what was happening, including my mom and Sammy's parents. The car honk, honked again. You're lucky I've got to get to my work shift, coach said, but we'll talk about this next practice. Don't think we're done here. Now clear out all of you. My mom came up behind me in her yellow sari. Robbie, what's going on? Were you fighting? It wasn't anything, mom, just some joking around. It didn't look like joking. As everyone left the field and walked up the low grassy slope to the parking lot, Sammy looked back to me one more time, making a face at my mom's back. I was so mad I could have gone after him right then and there, but coach was watching me and I could tell he was just waiting for me to step out of line. Rabby, my mom pressed, not seeing what was happening behind her. It's nothing, mom. I glared after Sammy, wishing he were dead, hating coach Cochran for taking Sammy's side, hating them all. I feel bad about it now, looking back. When you're mad, you wish all kinds of things on people. Maybe you even think they deserve it. But it turns out that I didn't want anyone dead. I didn't even want anyone hurt. Not even when Coach Cochran tried to eat my brains. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Mr. Cochran didn't try to snack on my skull candy right away. I mean, he hated me right from the moment when I started asking questions about his baseball strategies. But that's not a brain-eating offense, right? It takes some serious weirdness to turn your baseball coach into a flesh-hungry maniac. We're going to stop there. I hope you enjoyed the first chapter of Zombie Baseball Beatdown by Paolo Bacigalupi. If you would like to check out a copy of this book, you will have a chance by entering the raffle in the library Google Classroom. Happy Friday.